Hello guys, welcome back to the channel, I hope you're doing well. Uh, another day, another part exchange beauty for us to have a look at. Uh, this one I know has got some issues. Um, we've given £600 for this current part exchange. I honestly don't really know why. Um, I wasn't involved with the deal, but um, I, I guess the values must be there to look at. I can't, can't say it looks uh, an amazing deal, but we will have a look around this car uh, take it for a quick test drive, find out what we think we need to do repair-wise. If we have time, I will try and get those repairs done uh, in the garage here, and then we'll be able to reach a satisfactory conclusion to the video, not just finding the fault, but also repairing them in the same video. No promises though, because I'm not that efficient. Anyway, uh, let's have a look at the car. It is a 2008 Ford C-Max. What a beauty. Uh, I know it's a 1.8 petrol. Uh, I'm just trying to have a quick look at what the model is. So it's a Z-Tech. Right, let's start at the front and have a little look around this thing. And you can already see there's a lot of condensation inside the window. Front bit of trim held on with some wood screws. It's always my favorite thing to see on a car is some wood screws. Um, Dumble Motors, so that's a local car to us. Um, I must say it was a part exchange, so I guess that would make sense. Um, front bumper seems to be a bit of a different colour and fits horrendously. So I imagine it could well have had a bit of a bump at some point and has been repaired. Uh, we've got alloy wheels, which unsurprisingly seem better days. But loads of tread on the tyres, some Debeekers, which are a budget tyre, but I can't actually say that I, you know, dislike them. They're, they're pretty good as far as budget tyres go. Um, inside the car's generally looking okay. A few scuffs and things, but stuff that will polish out. And the door handle there as well. Uh, good old Ford, it's got a bit of rust though. We've got a Marshall on the back, which has probably got five, six minute tread on it. Back bumpers not avoided damage either. I mean, this looks pretty fresh. They've reversed into something. And the back bumper looks a different color. And I know, obviously, some cars, you never avoid it. The, the, the bumpers, where it's plastic versus metal, uh, seem to have a different color. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if both had probably been done at some point. Maybe it wasn't a massive crash in particular, but maybe they were just a bit sort of bumped and scuffed because it was a bit of a careless driver and they've had them both touched up at the same time. I mean, it's all cracked and towing eyes missing. Scuffed to high hell around the back, so yeah, damage around here as well. More scuffs down the side. Yeah, it's um, probably been a bit of a workhorse. It's not really someone's pride and joy. And a bit more rust. I don't think that's rust, it's just a bit cruddy. Another Debeeker on the front and on the back. I honestly can't tell you because it looks like this has been driven flat and I think it might say a vent something. Um, I don't know how well you can see, but that's obviously been driven flat and rubbed most of the sidewall and writing off. Um, other than that, we've got all wing mirror covers and all the wing mirrors are on the car. Always a bonus when it comes to part exchanges that I've bought anyway. Um, rear privacy glass. Obviously I'm picking out the worst parts of the car here, but on the whole, not, not awful, you know. Car of this age, it's bound to have some marks, right? Let's have a little look inside. Uh, we have got one remote key and one non-remote key. All seems to work. Okay, first thing that jumps out at me, which you won't be able to tell, is that it smells pretty damp in here. It's kind of stale, fausty smell. Um, so, yeah, whether we've got a bit of water coming in somewhere or something. Um, yeah, it's not clean in here by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not that grimy, you know. Some cars are filthy and every kind of nook and cranny has got some kind of grease and horribleness in it, but this hasn't. 
It's, uh, it just wants a good hoover really and uh, it wouldn't be too bad. Quick look in the back. Okay, we've got some weird kind of stain. Looks like children's milk or something. And I would not be surprised if that was the uh, source of the majority of the smell. There's been a bit of a spillage. And we've got the starts of some mold going on in here as well. Or well, particularly on this center seat. Uh, so that's all one a good wet vac. The roof lining doesn't look too bad though. These can be pretty knackered on like a family type car like this, but that's not too bad. Our rear seat trays are still working. These are the ones that got the little floor storage. Nothing in that one. Nothing in there. Oh, nice bit of string of hair there. I always thought it was a clever feature on these cars that have got the little fold down mirror in the back. So if you're on the front, you can keep an eye any kids in the back. Um, got window blinds. It's quite a nice feature. Uh, I noticed this side, obviously the clip is broken. So we have a bit of old, oh it's a paper clip isn't it? Can we even make it work? Yeah we could. I mean, better than nothing but definitely not a factory fix. Quick look in the boot. A bit creaky. We've got one of the mud flaps in there. Don't know which one that was from actually. I think probably near side front. Spare wheel. Kit and everything all seems to be under there. That all looks reasonably tidy. The boot carpet does feel a little damp actually. I can see any mould back here in particular but boots are very often the source of the damp coming into your vehicle around a light or boot handle or something like that it's not too bad but worth noting I've just walked around and checked both sides of the car for the pull handle for the bonnet so we can have a look in there but of course as a Ford being of this era doesn't have one you've got to use the key in fact this one though it's different you don't use the key for this so you spin your badge across and you put on your bit of plastic with a Self-tapping screw in it. Um, God. These are notoriously. Well, so we've got, you see that plastic, I don't know if you can see that plastic rod goes all the way in. Um, oh, I could have just broken something. Oh, jeez. Not a good start. Uh, I think I need to go and get a long screwdriver and uh, see if we can open up that. Really common problem on these C-Max, Focus, anything they've got this. Mondeo as well, I think Mondeo's had them. This key system where you put the key in, you turn it left and right and it opens up. They just break, so most people will replace them with something that has either a spare key or no key. But if you do break your uh, mechanism and you don't have the key or etc, what you, the tool you need is a dam. A dam and a big flathead screwdriver. There we go. There we go. Smashing, if you don't have your own dam, I think just a big screwdriver and a bit of effort will work. Well, first and foremost, I suppose, this is the mechanism. This is what you're trying to get to with your, your massive screwdriver through here. This one still seems to have some plastic stuff in it, which I'm, I'm fairly certain now that I look at it. This is part of a toilet system handle. Uh, some of you may or may not know, but I am a plumber slash gas engineer by trade, so that jumps out of me straight away. Uh, right, back to the car. Oh, looks quite neat and tidy in here. That was a bit of plastic, not me. Um, coolant looks nice, overfilled maybe. Um, looks like a brand new alternator down there which is very interesting considering what we're going to talk about with this car in a minute. Um, let's have a quick look at the state of the oil. Mmm, does look a bit smeggy, doesn't it? But I would honestly say on a petrol car like this, a lot of people would see that in a car straight away and panic, right? And think, okay, hey, gasket must be gone. Uh, you get, you know, an element of this just from condensation on cars, especially uh, petrol cars and if they don't get driven a huge amount then um, just from the condensation in an engine you you can get that so um, that's why you also check the coolant make sure there's not any signs of um, oil in there 
and sometimes even if there's not oil in there if you open up the cap and you look inside which do you know what we'll do it right cap off um obviously goes about saying don't do this when it's hot you will burn yourself probably nice and clean no signs of like any oil sitting on top or doing anything weird and the other thing you want to look for because if someone's got a car and the head gasket's gone they might just clean out the coolant system put fresh coolant in but you'll always see just like smeggy remnants of what would be oil in the bottom around the pipe things like that it just gets stuck in there um it's pretty hard to clean that out without uh you know putting on a brand new coolant bottle which again would be another red flag potentially i guess but i honestly don't think there's any issues with this um head gasket wise so oil looks okay other than the fact that it doesn't look like there's much in here actually oh no i take that back more than enough overfilled but there's no signs of gunkiness or if you're again worried about um head gasket you spot a bit of spot a bit of gunkiness in there and you think oh is that just from condensation or is it from have a look at the oil from the dipstick and if it looks like a cappuccino um you know kind of milky and really light brownie looking like a kind of like a frothy coffee then um yeah you probably have got head gasket gone but that oil is looking really clean no signs of water in there again just backing up my thoughts that it's perfectly fine oh well it's nice to be in here not because of the car because it smells and yeah it's not the most glamorous of places but it is nice because it's still absolutely freezing out there and i'm very much looking forward to some warmer weather right as for the car let's have a little look we are on 113,000 miles exactly you don't often see that do you it kind of goes back to one of my other videos which was uh the volvo v40 i guess it had been clocked it'll update for you if you have seen that video and you're here because of that bca do not want to give me my 600 pounds back for the paintwork um apparently the vendor who has agreed to take that car back uh doesn't pay for out-of-pocket expenses and you think well even when they fraudulently sold me a vehicle it was as much as i expected really um difficulty with bca is if you really kick up a fuss with them they've got a bit of a habit and they're quite well known for just saying okay you know we're just gonna you know, ban you just to spend your account and you can no longer buy from bca and uh you know that's just kind of cuts off one avenue of uh of business for your business if you're in the car trade so if you haven't seen that video i'll put a clip here so those who haven't seen it watch that video you understand what i'm talking about anyway back to the original point of what i was saying is it's on exactly 113,000 miles it reminds me of the fact that i was saying oh the volvo v40 had had a sticker which said that the camber had been done on exactly 185,000 miles it seems unlikely but cars do arrive at garages on exactly round numbers you know to the nearest thousand um so yeah it seems unlikely like mm, seems unlikely it sounds like a made-up number but it does happen here's proof so no automatic lights no automatic wipers like i say we've got our lovely mirror this is what i was talking about earlier so if you sat in the front you can see your kids in the back i don't know if it just side to side now so you just got this rounded mirror you're sat in the driver's seat this is my view but obviously in reality that's kind of how you'd see it you can see what the kids are up to in the back or your drunk mates who are vomiting or something oh um yeah well we'll leave that down all the time because it doesn't latch anymore uh we have got cd radio uh, we have got an auxiliary in two cup holders in a very convenient position five speed let's have a quick look in the glove box uh locking wheel nut is that a radio code no i think that's a locking wheel nut code we've got, oh we've got the radio code there oh and a business card from the previous uh, person who sold it who was a local competitor to me so you, i'm gonna have to blur that out aren't i can't uh, can't possibly do that just kidding dumble motors of bridgewater uh i can't recommend or dissuade you from using them i don't really know but um yeah love competition so that's where it came from nothing else in there though and i can tell you that this car does not have any service history whatsoever not ideal let's fire it up ah flat battery 
Wonderful, flat battery. I really wish I hadn't closed that bonnet now because now I'm going to need to go and get my tool down again to, uh, to open the bonnet. But uh, it does give me the opportunity to show you a lovely bit of kit that I've been sent. The lovely people at Top Don have sent me their JS1200 jump starter to try. So uh, this will be the first chance to use it. And it's literally arrived in the post this morning. I haven't even charged it. So um, let's see how it does on starting this uh, Ford C-Max. So as you can see, it's quite a neat little unit. We turn it on. Okay, so we've got 75% power. So it'll be interesting to see how we do with this 1.8 engine. Okay, connection's on. Let's hop in the car. Let's see if it'll go. <clears throat> no problems at all. Well, top marks for the top Don so far. Uh, we quite often need jump packs, unfortunately, dealing in used cars. I'm quite impressed so far how tiny this unit is. It's got a torch on the bottom and it comes in this nice little carry case which everything fits in. As a car trader it's exactly the sort of thing you just want to stick in your bag or if you're going away on a trip just stick this in the glove box it's going to fit in there no problems and it will start your car. So yeah check out Top Don. I'll put a link in the description. So we do have the battery light on. It's probably flashing on this camera. Um, but I believe the previous owners of this vehicle did make Dan aware that there were some electrical issues with the charging. Uh, maybe it wanted an alternator, but it looks like they've already had an alternator and they still have problems. Uh, I wonder whether it's a dodgy alternator. It's just sometimes you get a low quality ones, they're not very good. Or there could be something else. It could be like a trace wire or something. I don't know, that's what the mechanics are telling me. Uh, so we might need to get our electrical chat to look at it. We have got an alternator here to try and put on it. If it's not charging while we're driving, I could end up being completely stranded. Um, it's all well and good being able to start the car again, but if it's not charging while you're driving, you'd have to leave that jump pack on, and I wouldn't want to do that to the poor JS1200. Considering we did know that there were some potential electrical gremlins with this car, I'm not quite sure why we gave 600 quid for it. Maybe Dan thought there was 500 quid in the glove box or something. Uh, I don't know, because it's probably about a 2,000 pound car out um, in Minter's condition, which clearly it's not. The facts are, it's cost us 600 quid, um, and we will try and fix it to see if we can, you know, wipe our nose of it and uh, not lose any money, or if we're lucky, make a little bit of money. So I'm gonna leave this running for a minute, have a quick cup of tea, and then we will get out on the road. Oh, okay, it's been a good 10, 15 minutes. We have got perfectly clear vision now. The car is still running, always a bonus. Let's, uh, let's see how we do. Also worth noting, temperature is bang in the middle, if not slightly under, so it's not overheating at all. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good sign as far as our head gasket concerns as well. Let's, uh, let's see how she drives. Okay, so we have engine management, battery, and fuel reserve light on. And the trip computer is telling me that we have one mile remaining in the tank. So this won't be a hugely long test drive. Got pretty good induction noise up this thing. Listen to this. Ooh. Sprightly. Well, we're now on zero miles range, so keep your fingers crossed for me. Oh, power steering malfunction also. It <laughs> this thing is it's a bit late for Christmas lights, but the dashboard is lit up like a tree, so. I'm hoping these are all related and uh, it's all to do with voltage issues and it's the alternate. Oh, then the power steering's fine again now. Uh, it's happy. I mean, the power steering feels fine. Oh, it's back again. It's back again. And it's also telling us that there's like a frost warning light, but uh, it's cold, but it's not that cold. Yeah, I definitely think there's either a drop link or two and maybe maybe a, a blown shock on the back, although it's handling okay, but there's just that kind of hollow -dum 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 noise rattling away from the back there. Um, yeah, so it's not just the electrical issues with this one. Of course, 2008 Ford C-Max ZTEC is not the most glamorous or exotic car in the world, but 
a bit like the Mondeo I reviewed earlier in the week, it just does what it should and it does it pretty well. It's extremely comfortable to drive, it's very easy to drive, um, very practical obviously. Build quality is decent enough, at least when it comes to, don't, don't get me wrong, the interior components and materials used, they're not of the highest quality, but it feels solid. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it, but I guess there's enough sound deadening, the panels and interior trims and everything fit well enough. This isn't like an old school Seat or something where it, everything is rattling and just driving you mad basically. They feel, you know, well put together. Performance is shockingly bad. It is only a 1.8 naturally aspirated petrol engine, I suppose, with a reasonably heavy body, but you know, it's not, hugely bigger than say a Focus, so you'd expect it to be a little bit better, but it's very underwhelming and not particularly confidence inspiring, I have to say. I wonder what the brakes are like. They work. Clutch is reasonably high. It's not slipping and it doesn't feel so high as to be ridiculous, but it's definitely in that top or end of the travel of the pedal. I don't know whether they tend to be a bit like that, a bit light and high, or whether the clutch is well due a change by now. Handling wise, it feels pretty solid and planted well enough, but the only way you could really tell that you're quite planted is by visually seeing it, because there is almost zero feeling of connection to the road in this car. It's very light steering. It's a reasonably high center of gravity, I suppose. It's not. Not hugely high, but <laughs> you just don't really, you know, race car this is not. You are not feeling the road and the bumps with the steering at all. Um, obviously that will suit a lot of people, you know, the mums who want to chuck the kids in the back and kind of just waft along, bounce off the curbs and, you know, not, not feel any of it. Well, it will do that, but there's no feeling of joy when you're driving this thing, that's for sure. Standard Ford, the radio is pretty decent. Nice and bassy for a standard system. It, you know, it, uh, it performs an awful lot better than most standard car stereos, I'd say. Reasons to buy a Ford C-Max. None, literally none. Why would you buy this over a Ford Focus? Yes, you might have slightly more generous interior space, but at the cost of what? Your dignity for a start. And secondly, the enjoyment of driving the vehicle. The Focus is a great car to drive. You're not really gaining that much more in here for that benefit. I bet you could spend the same money and get a better equipped Focus than you could a C-Max. So um, I can't really see the benefit besides feeling like you've got a little bit more interior space. Apologies to C-Max drivers. It's actually not a particularly offensive or ugly car really, is it? It's just very middle of the road gray man you know this car does not stand out people will not notice you in it you are the invisible gray man in this thing which you know maybe you like but yeah people aren't gonna be like oh i love your c-max that's just it's just not gonna happen is it so the real test is gonna be whether this car will start again once we turn it off now The alternator is working. That doesn't mean that it's not the cause of our electrical issues though. I think the next thing we do is pester Steph in the workshop to um, get this in and change the alternator or do his other tests and whatever stuff he does. Uh, see if we can't get this fixed in the next couple of days or at least find a conclusion to whether that's gonna fix it. Uh, and I will try and tag that on the end of this video. So I'll see you in a few days. So, as if by magic, two days later, the C-Max is fixed. I'm in the passenger seat, I'm being driven by some kind of hoodlum. Um, but there are no longer any weird warning lights and the suspension sounds pretty good too. Steph's had it in and changed the alternator, which cost me a grand total of 140 quid, um, plus his time fitting it, which was a couple of hours. Uh, so, I think this car is now probably easily worth 1500 quid so it's not the end of the world we're going to drop it off down at our trade disposal site type thing which maybe i'll talk about in a future video 
um, and we're on our way to go and pick up another cheap car so keep an eye out for that video thank you for watching and we'll see you later see you later bye